Good to see you this morning. I hope you had a great week. If you are new here with us at Albion Baptist Church, my name is Barry Hall. I'm the pastor here. And a little bit about our church. We are a church community that, regardless of your background, and whether you're from a different denomination, or maybe you've been at a church for a long time, or maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. And so wherever you are, whichever one of those things describes you, we want you to know there is a place for you here at Albion Baptist where you can come in and get connected to the body of Christ. Together, we'll help each other grow in our relationship with Christ so that we're better prepared for him to send us, either out into this community or wherever else he takes us from here, a little bit further along in our walk with the Lord than when we came to Albion. Now, that's a little bit about us as a church. And so if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we're going to ask you to tell us a little bit about you. Nothing scary, nothing crazy. I'm not going to ask you to get up and introduce yourself or anything like that. You should have gotten one of these from our connection team when you came in. Um, so if you would just fill it out, tell us a little bit about yourself. That's what it says at the top of that. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of contact information to help us get to know you a little bit. And then there are two offering plates back there on the heater at the back of the room. So after the service on the way out, just drop it in one of those offering plates when you, when you dismiss. On the back of that, and this is for everyone, it says prayer requests. And so if there's a way we can be praying for you, or in any way we can specifically minister to you, there are some extra ones in the back that you may not have gotten when you came in if you're not a first-time guest, but there are some extra ones back there by those offering plates, so feel free to grab one. There's some pens back there as well, so if there's any way we can be praying for you, fill that out. Um, you can fill up that offering plate a little bit later uh, after you use this uh, extra service. Okay, so let me draw your attention to a couple of announcements, and I'm not going to read them. I promise you this morning I'm actually not going to read them, but I do encourage you to look at either the announcement email we also share the link for that on the Facebook page, and we shoot it out to the WhatsApp group, and it is available in the YouVersion Bible app. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we are working on the possibility of creating a church-wide app of our own, but in the meantime, we use YouVersion because it's free. And so if you, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, hold it up, you'll go to the events tab in there, and you'll see our service, and you'll see the announcements in there. I encourage you to read through them. I just want to mention one, and then I'm going to ask Tony Rose to talk about one other starting here very soon. But the one I want to mention is we are doing a fall fruit drive. And this is primarily for Italian families that are struggling really badly because of this COVID thing that continues to drag on. And so we're working with a ministry in Portanone called Caracas. And so everything we collect, we will take over to them. And so starting next Sunday on the 1st of November, and the, in the last three Sundays we'll be meeting in this building, the 1st, the 8th, and the 15th of November, there will be a collection box in the Welcome Center when you first come in. There's a list of food items that are there in the, in the announcements. That's the list that they gave us things that they need. Um, they will gladly take stuff if you buy it at the commissary, but they really would prefer we buy it off base. So all the instructions and stuff are in Italian, given them as Italian families that are going to be receiving these things. So bring the stuff, look down the list, take it with you when you, when you go out to come out or we or whatever. And then the first, eighth, and fifteenth will be a collection box out here. Drop that stuff off. And then we'll have time to take it over and we deliver it to Caracas and Fort Knox. So take a look at the rest of the announcements, see some of the other great stuff that's going on. Uh, make sure you, you find the opportunity for you to get plugged in here. You'll be blessed and be a blessing. So I'm going to ask Toby Roach to come on up and talk to us about. We've been talking the last couple of weeks about this new ministry that we're starting called Celebrate Recovery. And so Toby, I'm going to ask you to come up and share. Morning, church. Uh, I did this at 9.15 this morning. If you have any visions about things you're going to go, and then you, you walk away from the toilet, it's a little strange. So I'm going to take a different approach. I'm not going to get as deep as I did on the first one. Uh, but my name is Tony Roach. I'm a believer of Christ that suffers from a multitude of sins in my life, depression, anger, jealousy, envy, you name it. I run the game on And I came to know Silver Recovery in 2014 when I was at a crossroads in my life. I, Grew up pretending that life was perfect, and that followed me into my adult life. And then I got married and had four kids, and still decided to pretend my life was I was strong and confident, and, and everything was great. In reality, that was a lie because, as we all know, we're all sinners and we suffer from uh, all the types of things that I just talked about that I suffer from. And so, found Celebrate Recovery. The first night I went, I, I just I couldn't believe I was at that place in my life, but uh, it ended up being a great turning point for me, and I am a firm believer in it, and so it is a program developed by Rick Warren, and it is based in the Beatitudes, uh, in the New Testament, and it is a Christ-centered program that teaches you to look forward and not necessarily dwell on the past, to identify where you might be having struggles in your life, and to look to Christ to solve that and get you moving in the right direction. So we'll meet on, on Monday nights at 6 o'clock, starting on 2 November. And it is a lesson, it's some worship, a lesson, and then we'll have an open group, open share, where you can come and just kind of talk about what life has to offer you. 
extensive 12-step study that is kind of based like on Alcoholics Anonymous, but it is a large umbrella that covers every type of hurt, hang-up, or issue you may have in life. So I encourage you to come out and join us in that. Today. We're looking for people to help uh, on the women's side of the house because it's a, it's a, it's a co-located group to begin with, and then we split into a men's and women's group. You're not there to solve anyone's problem. You're just there to share and just and just lean upon each other and confess your sins. And with that, I have a second announcement to make. And I have to confess to Barry that I, I, I just lied to you while we're going, so I have to <laughs> So, what better place to go? Mackenzie, could you bring that up? So I'm going to get you and Jeannie to come up for a minute. I don't know if anyone knows, but this is the Pastor Appreciation Month. And I wish I could take credit for that, but I know all these types of events that happen, but I've been the last person to ever know that. So, on behalf of the church, we have a little gift for you and Jeannie. And I want you to know that as a pastor, uh, I look at it as a military member as like a first surgeon on steroids. You're constantly there for everyone. I get texts from you like at 6 a.m. discussing ministry. You're, you're just always involved. You're humble. You're kind. You're forgiving. You're what we need in a pastor. And so I see no better, no better person to recognize right now than you for that. But with that, Jeannie, as we all know in the military, that we may go to work and we may do that type of stuff, but it does not happen without our spouses. So everything that Barry is is probably more of a huge testament to you than it is just for who he is. And so this is for both of you. And so on behalf of the church, thank you for your service and thank you for all that you do for us as a church. And I hope you enjoy it.
it was especially this Sunday, Amanda and Sonia Serta were supposed were assigned as volunteers for children's ministry this morning, and Amanda has gotten sicker and sicker all week. I'm sure she's around or not, but she's she's down to the count. And then about eight o'clock last night, Sonia sent me a text that she had it too. So we scrambled around at about eight or eight thirty last night um, and, and got the Stoyers in to do cover two of the classes and Jordan Conway to cover the third. So they were not the folks that were planning. To serve in children's ministry this morning. They were planning to be right here in this service this morning. So when you pick up your kids from children's ministry, make sure you thank them for the work they're doing. Let them know how much you appreciate it. Well, we have a lot to cover this morning, so I'm going to ask you to grab your Bible, turn with me back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where we were last week, and we're making our, through, our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians. We handled the first several verses in chapter 4 last week, and we're going to wrap up the chapter this morning. And what Paul is talking about, these last verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he's talking about events that will happen in the last days. And so let me just go ahead and read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He says, but we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another and what I believe Paul is referring to in these verses is what is commonly called the rapture. Now, if you read through any English Bible or even read through the New Testament Greek, you won't find the word rapture. It's, it's based on that word in verse 17, caught up is what it's translated into English. It's from the Latin word raptoro. That's where that, the idea of calling this the rapture comes from. But that's what I believe he's talking about. Now, the way I understand the chronology of end times events, and you, you may have a different understanding of the order of things that are going to take place, and that's okay, but the way I understand the chronology of end times events, the rapture, when Jesus pulls his church out, ca catches up his church out of the earth, into the air with him, that will be the thing that will immediately precede that seven-year period that Daniel prophesies about. Jesus called it a time of tribulation. That time, we know from reading through Scripture, that time is going to be this intense, unrivaled, unrestrained suffering and evil in this world. Now, I know that end times events are those things that grab our attention. We have the, the I do the Monday Pastor's Bible Study, I record it, I put it up on YouTube, and before we started our current lesson, I asked the folks that were involved, what is it that you want to study next? And, and there was a lot of interest in studying end times events. And we would have really had to take a long time to dig into those. But at end times events are those things that really capture our attention. But I don't want us to dig too far down into the weeds of the specifics of the end times events he's talking about this morning. Now, and I want to do that for two reasons. Avoid doing that for two reasons. First of all, there is no clear timeline in Scripture. The Bible doesn't tell us enough about the timing of those events for any of us to draw any kind of dogmatic position. This is the way it must be. This is the order in which things must take place. The other thing, though, is, and I think maybe this is the more important thing, is what, what I believe is Paul's intent here in talking about this. Remember, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church, and, he, and he's written them a pastoral letter. He didn't write them a theology textbook, although there was a great deal of theology here in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians as well. But his intent was not to write them a theology textbook. And so his intent is pastoral more than it is educational. In verses 13, he gives his, his, his purpose statement, verse 13 and again, verse 18. Verse 13, he says, I'm writing this stuff to you so that you won't, will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And that's kind of, he sort of lays out initially his purpose statement for why he's writing these things. And then he hits it again in verse 18. Comfort one another with these words. Kind of his bookends, he gives his purpose for why I'm telling you about these things end times events. And then in the middle, we have this sort of repeated phrasing. Verse 14, 15, 16. 
for if we believe, for this we say to you, for the Lord himself. And that word for can be translated because. So he, he gives his purpose in writing this so that you will not grieve as though those who have no hope. Because, because, because. And so what I think he's doing is he's laying out the case for hope. He's talking about this event that I believe is, is we, the event we refer to as the rapture. But he's using it to lay out a case for why we have hope. And so here's what I think is the big idea this morning. If you're new with us this morning, you know, I'll be on the back of the slide. you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You might have a very different perspective about the return of Jesus. When he comes back, that may not be an event you look forward to. That may not be an event that brings you a great deal of comfort or a great deal of hope if you don't have a relationship with Christ. But for those of us here this morning that do know Christ as our Savior, this event, and I think this is what Paul is, is pointing forward to, laying out this case for hope is a significant source of comfort and hope. And, and here's how I, how I see his case laid out. He talks about the reality of hope. That when we think about the return of Jesus, there is a reality, an objective reality of hope that you and I can have, and how we know we can have it, and why we can have it. And then he moves on from there, and he talks about the reasons for hope. And he lays out, in this passage, three specific reasons why you and I can have hope in Christ. And then he wraps it up, verse 18, with a reassurance of hope. Comfort one another with these words. So I want us to kind of follow his outline a little bit and, and see this case that he's laying out for hope. First thing he talks about is this. I'm going to plug it there. I do that every single week. You think after the three or four weeks I've gotten this by now, but I added this slide a few weeks ago. This slide is specifically for you kids. So this is the slide for kids. I'll put the key words of the message. So if your children want to jot those words down, and then kids, as you hear me say those words, just make a little mark next to it or reach over and squeeze mom and dad's hand so that they can stay engaged with the message as well. So I'll leave that up there for a minute as I see a pen or two wagging the key words in this message this morning. Hope, promise, and comfort. Someone once said this about hope. He said, hope is to our spirits what oxygen is to our lungs. Lose hope and you die. Now, they may not bury you for a while, but without hope, you're dead inside. Hope is the energy of the soul. It's the power of tomorrow. And if you are a believer in Christ, those of us who know Christ as Lord and Savior, we have a hope that transcends this world. I know as you open up the news every day, the only the first ten headlines or whatever all corona this and corona that and the latest speculation about what the next set of restrictions are going to bring and this and this and this and this, right? And it's easy to read those headlines and kind of, oh my goodness sakes, you know, lose hope. But for those of us who know Christ as Lord and Savior, our hope transcends this world. Our hope stands above and apart from it. We have a source of hope that is not dependent on what happens here. Look there what he says in verse 13. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. In other words, don't be uninformed, dot, 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 so you will have hope. And so if we look at the reality of hope, how do we know hope? We sang about it just a, a few moments ago, how you know, I didn't know my sin until I opened up the Word of God. Now, how do we know hope? How do we know what that is? It's not by the world. It's not by those things you're going to see in the news feed, those top ten stories about the coronavirus. We're not going to find any hope there. It's not by the, the promises of man. We are in an election season right now. 
And I'm not going to preach politics from behind the pulpit. That's not my job. That's not my role. But we are in election season right now. You can't turn on the TV. You can't watch any, any TV show without some political ad popping up. Some politician of some color, some flavor, talking about all the things they're going to do. Making all these promises that they're, they're, going to, they're going to fulfill. And I encourage us as believers to pray and to, to evaluate the candidates, evaluate what they're saying against the word of God, and then vote. Most of us in this, in this congregation are affiliated with the U.S. military somehow. And that's part of the reason you put on the uniform every day, to secure and defend our right to vote. I encourage you to take advantage of that incredible privilege and do that. But listen, we've got to realize this, that the word of a politician is not something you can take to the bank. That's not something you can bet on. There's not a lot of hope in those. We can't count on those always, the words and the promises of man. How do we know hope? We know hope by a revelation. read that book, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. If you haven't, I encourage you. He's got a whole Case for series. The case, the case for Jesus and the Case for Christ and the Case for the Resurrection. The Case for Faith. I encourage you to read those if you haven't. Lee Strobel was a, an investigative journalist. And he, he decided he was going to use his journalistic skills to disprove the Bible. And the more he dug in, the more he studied, the more he researched, the more he became convinced that the Bible was true. He became a, a powerful believer who's written these books, The Case for Christ. And our, our Road Radio home group is doing a Bible study. So if you're not plugged into a home group yet, I encourage you to get plugged into that if you want to dig in more into this book, The Case for Christ. But Lee Strobel points out this in that book. He said, after the crucifixion, we find the disciples are holed up in the upper room. And they're, they're terrified. They're afraid. They're timid. They're defeated. But then just a, a short time later, just a few weeks later, we get into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Just a few weeks later, they're fearlessly preaching Jesus out publicly. He said, what happened? What happened in that span of time, just a little, a little over a month and a half? What took place to turn these guys from these timid, fearful, hopeless, defeated guys to these guys that would stand out publicly and boldly, fearlessly proclaim Christ? Here's what happened. They met the resurrection. They saw him. They interacted with him. And that changed everything. That was a complete game changer for them. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Separated from God. And if Christ has not been raised, he's no different than you are. He's just another person, just like you and me. He can do nothing for us. He's in, in a tomb somewhere, just like everyone who's gone before him. And if he hasn't been raised, Paul said, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sin. But here's the good news. Here's the hope. He goes on. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Christ has been raised. Listen, the reality is that because, because Christ has been raised, you and I can have hope. It puts God's stamp of validation on his work on the cross. Our sins have been paid for. They can be 
For you, there is hope. We know hope by the revelation of God. We can have hope because of the resurrection by God. The reality is that hope is available. God showed himself in his word, revealed himself to us in his word, the God of hope. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And because he was raised to life, he can give you and I life. Paul begins laying out his case for hope on that point, the reality of hope. And then he moves on from there, from the reality of hope to the reality. We say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. What's the reason for hope there in verse 15? I think he's laying out his case for the reasons for hope. And what's the reason for hope in verse 15? For this we say to you, how? By the word of the Lord. You can count on this, because this is from the word of the Lord. That's the reason for hope, is he begins to lay out his case. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, he said, no one hopes for what he has. And that just makes sense, right? Most of, most of you are in the military, or many of you are in the military. Now, if you get promoted, you've got a line number. Then that, that, that day comes when you sew on that stripe, when you change that shiny thing on your collar. The day after that, when you, are, when you have been promoted, you don't go into work and say, I hope I get promoted. Right? That doesn't make any sense. You already have it. Nobody hopes for what they have. Hope is all about the future. Hope is all about promise. Hope is all about things not yet realized. When we think about the, the hope of promise, all of God's promises are certain. All of God's promises are absolutely certain. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, the Hebrew writer said this. He said, so that by two hundred God are absolutely certain. It's impossible for him to lie, impossible for him to tell us something that is not true. Let me ask you this morning, which promises of God do you struggle with? Toby talked a few minutes ago about how we, we can get together in this group, celebrate recovery. You can share your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups and the things that you're struggling with. Which promises of God do you struggle with? He reminded me, listen, if God can keep his promise to raise Jesus from the dead, right, from a human perspective, the most unlikely thing, right? I mean, from a human perspective, that doesn't make any sense. But if God can keep his promise to do that, there is, he can be absolutely counted on to do everything that he says. Paul lays out his case here. The reasons we have for hope, one of the reasons we have for hope is that God's promises are certain. And then verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I want you to just think about that scene for a minute in your head. Can you get it? Can you picture what that scene's going to look like? And it kind of reminds us a little bit the best we can be compared to in this world, like a visiting dignitary to a city, right? And you have the, the town crier, so to speak, who, who would go out. And he, he would announce the dignitaries coming. Behold, here comes one who is great. He would announce the dignitaries coming. And then the trumpet somewhere would blast. So we couldn't miss the event. There'd be this grand fanfare of this dignitary. Everybody would rush out to see who is coming. Right? That's kind of how the, the scene looks in, in my mind, anyway. Mm -hmm. After all is said and done, after the absolute very worst that Satan can throw at the people of God, and after the absolute worst that Satan can throw at the plan of God, Jesus returns in this grand fanfare, undeterred. The plan of God, not, not moved off the tracks, not one single bit, not deterred one single moment. Jesus returns in this grand fanfare after all is said and done. 
And we have hope because the promises of God are certain. But we have hope because the victory of God. unleashed on God's people and on God's plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 is what Paul said. But thanks be to God to experience that victory. It gives us hope. We have hope because the, the promises of God are certain. We have hope because the victory of God is solid. And then verse 17, reasons for hope. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. For those who are in Christ and alive when this happens, now we don't know when that's going to take place, but for those of us who are alive and in Christ when this happens, they will be with the Lord forever. For those who were in Christ and will have passed away before this event happens, they will be with the Lord forever. Is there any question about the future? Any question about the eternal destiny about those who are in Christ? Whether you live your life when this happens or whether you pass away before it happens, if you're in Christ, you will be with the Lord forever. Is there any question? about the eternal destiny of those who are in Christ. Now, will you fail God at some point in time in your life? I guarantee it. you. You no doubt, you are honest with yourself, you can listen. You know you're there. Will you fail God at some point in time in your life? Absolutely, you will, without a doubt. Will you grieve the Spirit at some point in time? Magic 8 Ball says, outlook is certain. <laughs> There will be time. You, we will fail the Lord. We will grieve His Spirit. But here's the hope. That not only are, is the Word of God, the promises of God certain, the victory of God is solid, but eternal life is... I know my own weaknesses. I know my own failings. I know it's just a matter of time before I fail it again. Praise God, our eternal life is secure, not in me, but it's secure in Him. John 10, 28, this is what Jesus said. I give them... To know that no matter how many times we fail, no matter how many times that we have grieved His Spirit, that when we are in Christ, our eternity is secure in the end. Paul talks about the, the reality of hope. He lays out some, some compelling and powerful reasons for hope, and then he wraps it up with this, the reassurance of hope. Verse 18, comfort one another with these words. Now, he starts this section, back all the way up there in verse 13. He starts this section and he says, listen, I want to talk to you for a minute about your loved ones who have died. And then he ends it this way, comfort one another by these thoughts. And there's, there's really nothing in between those verses where, where Paul is talking about anything that would take away the pain of loss. But he starts, he says, I want to talk to you about oh, your loved ones who have died. And now I want, you, I want to end it with comfort one another. Be comforted, reassured by this, that for the believer, death is not the end. what it would be like. That day when we'll stand before the Lord. That day when we'll open our eyes in eternity and we'll stand face to face with Jesus and they keep asking the question or keep making the statement through the song, I can only imagine. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? That day when we cross over and over our eyes, stand face to face with the Lamb who was slain for us? What an amazing day. And for the believer, death in this, this side of eternity 
eternity is not the end. That, that's just the beginning of that. We're going to be with him 24 hours, seven days a week, every moment of every day for the rest of eternity to sing his praises and to be in his presence. What an amazing time. Paul said this in Philippians 1, verse 21. He said, for me to live as Christ... Eternity in his presence, eternity standing right there with him. I don't know which one to choose. Now, there's nothing he shared here. Don't take away the pain of the loss. But when we think about hope, the hope that we have in Christ, it puts the, the loss in this world in an eternal context, in, in the bigger picture. It helps us realize that the loss remains a reality here, but it's temporary. That for those of our loved ones who've gone before us, who knew Christ, and we'll see them again one day in some grand, glorious reunion when we all stand face to face with Christ. And though our minds beg to know, when is this going to happen, Lord? When are these things going to take place? And our minds just beg to know that answer. We don't. God, in His wisdom, He's told us everything we need to know, but He hasn't told us everything we ought to want. And he didn't tell us the time to do this. Why did he tell us that? You know why I think? Because we obsess about it, first of all. And we wait until the very last minute to do anything about it. He and his wisdom has not told us when this is going to happen. But even that is a source of hope. The imminence of these us to, to trust God's authority. It forces us to trust His judgment. Say, God, I would like it to be right now. I would like it to be tomorrow, but we have to trust His authority. We have to trust His judgment. And it gives us a, a great source of hope, a great source of comfort. When we realize and remember, God's not going to bring this about too early. He's not going to bring it about too late. He's going to bring it about just the right time and just the right the follower of Christ. We think about these end times events, the rapture and all the other events that Scripture tells us about. For those of us who are in Christ, when we think about the end times events, they're not scary things. They're not things that, that, that cause fear to well up inside us. They are a source of hope. They are a source of comfort. We eagerly await that great day. I'm going to ask our praise team to come back up. Because if you're not certain of your salvation, when you look at these end times events, they are scary events. It is a scary time. It's not a time you look forward to. It's not a time that you would label as a, a moment of hope. It's a scary thought. But here's a message of hope. Jesus came and will come again so that you and I can have hope. And as we sing this last song. I'm going to stand just a moment. We're going to end our time in another worship song. And as we sing this song, I want to ask you to consider this question. As we sing this last worship song, I don't want you to just sing the words. I want you to think about this thought to wrap around in your head. Because if you dread, you look forward to the return of Christ, and it's a moment that brings fear to your heart. It's a moment you dread. I'm going to invite you to come talk to me after the service. And I'll introduce you to the one who can flip it all around, give you hope. Make not only that a moment you look forward to it every day walking with you. Let's stand together and sing our final song.
directly in line with Pastor Barry's sermon, you know, like what, how often, you know, uh, it kept flashing across my mind how often I sin and how, how often I need that second chance and how hopeless I would be without that second chance and without the cross and without everything that Jesus has done for us and for me. And, uh, and so I just hope that that powerful image kind of literally just laying everything, all your sin and everything at the foot of the cross and literally clinging to it in hope that without, the, without these second chances over and over and over again, how, how we couldn't have that hope that Barry was talking about. Um, so just think about that. Um, <clears throat> if you know the song, sing along. If not,
Is that the moment in your mind and in your heart that brings great joy, brings great excitement, something you look forward to, or is it something that you dread? And if that is a moment that you dread, I love the words of that song, that the cross changes if that's a moment you've got, I invite you to come down. I'll be, I'll be down here after the service. So just come down and tell me I need to know Jesus. And I'll be glad to introduce you to that one that can change everything in this life and on in to eternity. Or if there's some other matter that you need someone to pray with you and encourage you, I'll be available to do that as well. If you are if you are new with us this morning, the first time this morning, I do encourage you to fill out, if you haven't already, fill out this little visitor slip, drop it in the offering plate in the back of the way out. Also, if you're away, we can be praying for you, a minister to you. Grab one of these for everyone. Grab one of these. There's pens back there. Fill it out for the offering plate in the back. I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. And just as a reminder, I'm going to do with all the COVID rules and all that stuff right now. After I dismiss us, we, it's not that we don't want to hang around in fellowship, but we, we can't for COVID's sake. So I just do encourage you as efficiently as possible to make your way to the exit doors in the back. If you are picking up your children and children's ministry, please do remember to thank our children's ministry workers. Let me pray it's out here this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ. Though we don't deserve it, Lord, we know we don't. We don't deserve it, yet because of your love and your grace and your mercy, you provide us a way to be forgiven and restored. You thank you. And thank you for giving us the privilege of being your messengers of hope. And Father, we pray that you would help us to, to be better, to, to grow in our relationship, that you can use us in this community and anywhere else you send us to be the messengers. And Father, we pray that you go with us now as we go from this place, Lord, that we would find ourselves in positions and find ourselves with your boldness to share your message of love and grace and hope. We pray in Jesus' name.